Check out this article on Motley Fool. It talks about Magellan Midstream and Enterprise products. The article talks about their extremely high dividend payments. My model also says Magellan is a buy. Let's find out why. Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Magellan Midstream stock by analyzing their financial ratios and dissecting their financial statements so we can determine if the stock is a buy or a sell. Magellan is an oil and gas midstream company. Midstream refers to points in the oil production process that falls between upstream and downstream. Midstream activities include the storage, processing, and transportation of petroleum. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, market cap $8.2 billion. They're trading at $36.57 a share. And to get shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding, $224 million. Let's look at their financials. Free cash flow, that's how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are property, plant, and equipment. And if a company has positive free cash flow, it makes it a lot easier for them to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it can make it difficult to do those things. And this company has positive free cash flow. It grows a lot from 2016 to 2018, but then drops in 2019. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. This company has positive and healthy net income each year. Revenue is the sales for the company, and their revenue grew 12% in 2017, then grew 11% in 2018, then dropped in 2019. Most oil and gas midstream companies had a drop in revenue in 2019. They have healthy net profit margins, 35 to 47%. Net profit margin is net income divided by revenue. It's how well you convert revenue into profit. 2019, they converted 37% of their revenue into profit. That means 63% went towards expenses. Let's look at the financial statements. This is the income statement. The top line is revenue. Below that is cost of revenue. It's good to look at these numbers as a percent of revenue because it's hard to tell whether they're growing at a faster or slower pace than revenue. So let's look at cost of revenue as a percent of revenue. Let's also look at operating expenses as a percent of revenue. The cost of revenue represents the cost involved in making and delivering the company's products. So the payroll for the employees on the front line, also the factory costs, that's all involved in cost of revenue. As revenue increases, you would expect cost of revenue to increase at a slower pace because economies of scale set in, you can buy more products at a discount. For this company, the cost of revenue increases at a greater rate than the revenue increases. You can see it's 30% in 2016, up to 34% in 2018. That's their peak year in revenue, 2018. So they're becoming less efficient, which isn't a good sign. An operating expense is an expense a business incurs through its normal operations. Examples are marketing expenses and payroll for support functions like human resources and accounting. So this company actually improves their operating expenses as their revenue goes up. It goes from 30.7% to 29.8%. So they are getting more efficient with their operating expenses, just not their cost of revenue. Below operating expenses, operating income. That's how much money the company makes in its day-to-day -day business, $1 billion. And below that is the interest they pay in their debt, also the interest they receive from their investments. That's $198 million. You want to make sure this number is quite a bit lower than operating income because if it was greater than operating income, that means a company would need to get into more debt just to run its day-to-day -day business. Below that is other because some companies generate money or lose money outside of their regular business operations. So the company passed through a $168 million gain in earnings from equity interest. The way this works is when a company owns 20% to 50% of another company. For example, if this company owned 50% of another company and that other company reported $100 million of net income on their 2019 income statement, this company would then report a $50 million gain on its income statement, but it did not receive any money, it's just accounting. So what they have to do is they have to reverse out that $50 million on the statement of cash flows. They also passed through a $29 million gain on sale of PP&E. 
Sometimes companies sell buildings or machinery. So if this company sold a building for $10 million, if the value of that building on the balance sheet is $5 million, this company would have to pass through a $5 million gain on its income statement. But if it sold a building for $10 million and it had $15 million on its balance sheet, it would pass through a $5 million loss onto the income statement. This is also a non-cash item because the cash happened years ago when they bought the building. So they would have to reverse it out on the statement of cash flows. So this company had a billion dollars of net income in 2019 and other years looked pretty good as well. And I'd make sure that operating income was in line with net income because if operating income was 100 million and they had a billion dollars of net income, that would be concerning because obviously they can't continue that forever. Because some companies report really high net income, but that's due to selling assets. You can't grow a business by selling it. Let's look at a statement of cash flows. To calculate free cash flow, it's cash flow from operations 1.3 billion minus CapEx 943 million. So their free cash flow was 377 million in 2019. Operating cash flow is a better indicator of a company's health than net income because operating cash flow adds back the non-cash items from the income statement. It also adjusts for working capital. So you can see the negative 168 million from equity investments because they added that onto their income statement because they didn't receive any cash. Depreciation and amortization is usually the largest non-cash item you see on a cash flow from operations. So everything looks good in their financials. They have lots of free cash flow remaining to grow their business. Let's look at the capital structure of the company. They have $4.7 billion of debt, $2.7 billion of equity, and the interest rate they pay in their debt is 4.29%. This company is an MLP. To qualify as a master limited partnership, the company must generate at least 90% of its revenue from natural resources or real estate. And 63% of their capital structure is debt, 37% is equity, and their cost of equity is 9.92%. To calculate cost of equity, we use a capital asset pricing model. And part of the CAPM formula is the beta. The beta is how volatile a stock is relative to the market. So the higher the beta, the more volatile the stock is, and the higher the cost of equity. The lower the beta, the less volatile the stock and the lower the cost of equity. This company has a beta that's pretty close to the market because the market as a whole has a beta of one. They have a beta of 0.99, so the stock moves with the market. And their WAC is 6.35%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And the WAC is a discount rate companies use when they want to take on new projects. And that's the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimate a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 11 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $10.7 billion. We divide that by 224 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 47.90. They're trading at 36.57, so they're trading at a 24% discount. It's a buy according to the model. Simply Wall Street has them valued at $50.59, so they're also saying the stock is undervalued. The way Simply Wall Street gets its valuation is using the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading the past few years. So the stock broke $70 a few years back, and it looks like it was pretty steady for a while. But like most stocks, especially oil and gas midstream stocks, and this is a really big company, so it should get through the pandemic pretty easily. Let's look at the historical dividends. So they never cut their dividend. It started at 76 cents five years ago, and it's been driven up to $1.03. So it looks like it's a great stock if you want a nice dividend. Their dividend yield is 11.19%. To calculate dividend yield, it's annual dividend over stock price. So as the stock price goes up, the dividend yield goes down. But always remember, financial performance of a company is not 100% correlated to the stock price. The only thing that's correlated to the stock price is supply and demand of the market. If there are more buyers than sellers, the stock price will go up. And if there are more sellers than buyers, the stock price will go down. No one can predict stock prices in the short term. But in the long term, if you invest in good companies and hold the stock, you should do better than most investors. Let's look at their financial ratios. They have a really good PE. The median is 15.9, the average is 17.7. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15, they're at 8.0, so investors are paying $8 for $1 of earnings. 
Price of sales is okay. The median is 2.0, the average is 4.6. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, there are 3.0. So investors are paying $3 for $1 revenue. They have a good price to book ratio. The median for the market is 2.3, the average is 4.8. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. I like to see below 3.5, there are 3.0. So investors are paying $3 for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. Good interest coverage ratio, the median is 3.9, the average is 12.8. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above two, there are 5.1, so they can easily cover their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, also called operating income on the income statement. ROE is really good. The median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, there are 38%. They have a low current ratio. The median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2, there are 0.7. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash, accounts receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to similar companies. I've done videos on 35 oil and gas midstream companies and Magellan is right here. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they are worse in PE and price of sales. Even though I said those ratios are pretty good, you always want to compare them against similar companies. Price to book, they're doing better than the average. They're not doing well in current ratio. They're much better than average in ROE. They're about average in debt and they're a little more than average in market cap. Their dividend yield is slightly lower than average at 11.19%. Average is 11.57%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 24% discount. Their ratios look pretty good and their financials look really good. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me, receive a custom valuation or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking the link in the description below. Every month I provide members with an Excel file to help them better analyze stocks. Thanks for watching.